Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories. Tonight's story is the sweet and surprising An Old Lady's Love Story by an unknown author. This story was published in Short Stories magazine in February of 1891. Now, let's open our imaginations and begin. I sat spinning at my little wheel in the sun, for the autumn day was cold, when I heard someone whistling, and, looking up, there was young Squire Turner, with his arms folded on the gate, looking over. When he caught my eye, he laughed. I blushed, and I arose and made him a curtsy. He was a handsome gentleman, the squire, and the hand from which he pulled the glove shimmered in the sun with pearls and diamonds, and he was bonny to look at, with his hair like spun gold in the October sunlight. When I curtsied, he bowed, making his curls dance over his shoulders, and, said he, I've spoiled one pretty picture that I could have looked at all day, but I've made another as pretty, so I'll not grieve. May I come in? And welcome, sir, said I, and I set a chair for him, for he was grandfather's landlord. But for all that I felt uncomfortable, for I was not used to fine company. He talked away, paying me more compliments than I was used to, for grandmother, who brought me up, said, Handsome is as handsome does, and beauty is but skin deep. Since I'm telling the story, I'll tell the truth. I had done wrong about one thing. Neither of the old folks knew that I wore Evan Locke's ring in my bosom, or that we'd taken a vow to each other beside the hawthorn that grew in the church lane. I never meant to deceive, but Granny was old and a little hard, and that love of mine was such a sweet secret. Besides, money seems to outweigh all else when people have struggled all their lives through to turn a penny, and they knew Evan was a poor, struggling young surgeon. I thought I'd wait a while until I could sweeten the news with the fact that he'd begun to make his fortune. Granny came in from the dairy five minutes after the squire was gone and heard that he had been there. I didn't tell her of his fine speeches, but there was a keyhole to the door she came through, and I have a guess she heard them. That night we had something else to think of. Misfortunes had come upon Grandfather, but I didn't foresee that, when the half-year's rent should come due, not a penny to pay it with would be found. All this time Evan Locke and I had been as fond as ever of each other, and he came as often as before to talk with Grandpa on the winter nights, and still every little while our young landlord, Squire Turner, would drop in and sit in his lazy way, watching me knit or spin. Once or twice he was flushed with wine and overbold, for he tried to kiss me, but, Squire or no, I boxed his ears for his pains, and no softer than I could help either. I could not help his coming, nor help seeing him when he came, and I didn't deserve that Evan should be angry with me. But he was. So high and mighty, and spoke as though one like the squire could mean no good by coming to so poor a place as the schoolmaster's. He made me angry, and I spoke up. For that matter, the squire would be glad to have me promise to marry him, said I. He thinks more of me than... Maybe you like him better said Evan. I don't say that, replied I, but bad temper and jealousy scarce make me over fond of another. I pray I may never have a husband who will scold me. For he had been scolding me, no other name for it. Well, Evan was wroth with me and I with him. Not heart deep, though, I thought, and I didn't see him for more than a week. I was troubled much, though. I knew he would come around again, and mayhap ask my pardon, for before you are wed you can bring your lover to his senses. So I did not fret after Evan's absence, nor quite snub Squire Turner, who liked me more than ever. But one night Grandfather came in, and, shutting the door, stood between Grandmamma and me, looking at me, and so strangely that we both grew frightened. At last he spoke. I've been to the Squire's said he. 
for the first time I had to tell him that I could not pay the rent when due. I opened my lips. Grandmama's hand covered them. Grandpa drew me to him. Thou'rt young, lass, said he, and they are right who call thee pretty. Child, couldst like the squire well enough to wed him? Ah, huh? cried Grandma. Sure you're not wandering. Squire Turner asked me for this lass of ours tonight. Of all women in the world, there is but one he loves as he should his wife, and that is our Agatha. I dreamt of golden rings and white roses on Christmas Eve, cried Granny. I knew the lass would be lucky. But I put my head on Grandfather's shoulder and hid my face. The truth must out, I knew. We'll have him and be a rich lady, said Grandpa. And when he had waited for an answer, I burst out with, No! And a sob together. She's frightened, said Grandmama. Nay, we must all wed once in our lives, my child. Then Grandpapa talked to me. He told me how poor they had grown, and how kind the squire was, and I had but to marry him to make my grandparents free from debt and poverty their lives through. If I refused and vexed the squire, heaven only knew what might happen. She'll ne'er ruin us, sobbed Grandmama. Oh, it was hard to bear, bitter hard, but now there was no help for it. I took the ring from my bosom and laid it on my palm and told them that it was Evan Locke's and that I had plighted my troth to him. And Grandmama called me a deceitful wench and Grandfather looked on as though his heart would break. Oh, I would have done anything for them, anything but give up my true love. That night I kissed his ring and prayed heaven that he might love me always. In the morning it was gone, ribbon and all, from my neck. I looked for it high and low, but found no sign of it, and I began to fear the loss that that dear ring was a sign that I would never marry Evan Locke. The days passed on, and he never came near me. Oh, it was cruel in him, I thought, to hold such anger for a hasty word he had provoked when I spoke it that he must know I loved him so. And Grandma would scarcely look at me, I know why now, and Grandpa sighed and moaned and talked of the workhouse, and I thought I should die of grief among them. One day Grandma said to me, It seems that your sweetheart is not over-fond of you, nor over-anxious to see you. Why not? said I. Where has he been this month back? Busy, doubtless, said I, with a smile though I thought my heart would burst. You're going with him, maybe. Where? said I. She went to the kitchen and beckoned in a woman who sat there, Dame Coombs, who had come over with eggs. I heard you rightly, she said. You told me Evan Locke and his mother were making ready for a voyage. They're going to Canada. My son, a carpenter, and a good one, though I say it, made the doctor a box for his things. The old lady dreads the new country, but she goes for the doctor's sake. There's money to be made there. I told you so, said Grandmother. I don't believe it, said I. They've sold the house and gone to Liverpool to take ship, and you may find the truth for yourself if you choose to take the trouble said Dame Coombs. I'm no chatterbox to tell falsehoods about my neighbors. And still I would not believe it until I had walked across the moor and had seen the shutters fast closed and the door barred and not a sign of life about the place. Then I gave up hope. I went home all pale and trembling and sat down at Grandmama's knee. It's true, said I. And for the sake of so false a lad, you'll see your grandfather ruined and break his heart, and leave me, that have nursed you from a babe, a widow. I looked at her as she sobbed, and I found the strength to say, Give me to whom you will, then, since my own love does not want me. 
and then I crept upstairs and sat down on my bedside, weak as though I had fainted. I would have thanked heaven for forgetfulness just then, but it wouldn't come. The next day Squire Turner was in the parlor as my accepted lover. How pleased he was, and how the color came back into Grandfather's old face, and Granny grew so proud and kind, and all the house was aglow, and only I sad. But I couldn't forget Evan, Evan whom I had loved so, sailing away from me without a word. I suppose they all saw I looked sad. The squire talked of my health, and would make me ride with him over the moors for strength. The old folks said nothing. They knew what ailed me. Only our little Scotch maid seemed to think there was aught wrong. Once she said to me, "'What ails you, miss? Your eye is dull and your cheek is pale, and your bra, grand lover, cannot make you smile. You're not that ill, either.' "'No, I am well enough,' said I. She looked at me wistfully. "'Gidden you tell me your all. I might tell you a cure,' she said. But there was no cure for me in this world, and I couldn't open my heart to simple Jenny. So the days rolled by, and I was close on my marriage eve, and Granny and Dorothy Plume were busy with my wedding robes. I wished it were my shroud they were working at instead. And one night the pain in my heart grew too great, and I went out among the purple heather on the moor, and there knelt down under the stars and prayed to be taken from the world. For how can I live without Evan? I said. I spake the words aloud, and then started up in a fright, for there at my side was an elfish little figure, and I heard a cry that at first I scarce thought earthly. Yet it was but Scotch Jenny who had followed me. "'Why do you call for your true love now?' she said. "'You sent him friar for the sake of the young squire.' "'How dare you follow and watch me?' But she caught my sleeve. "'Didn't be vexed.' she said. Just bide a wee and answer what I spear. It's for the love o' ye for a senior waist like the snaw wreath in the sun since the squire wooed ye. Was it your will the lad that loved the ground you trod on should have his ring again? What do you mean? said I. I'll speak again I lose my place, said Jenny. I rode with the mistress to young Dr. Locke's place past the moor, and there she lighted and gave him a ring, and what she said I know not, but it turned him the tint of death, and he said, There's not a drop of true blood in a woman kin she is false. And he turned to the wall and covered his eyes, and your granny rode home. There, tis all I can. Will it do? Ay, Jenny, said I. Heaven bless you and had I wings on my feet, I could not have come to the cottage door sooner. I stood before my grandmother, trembling and white, and I said, Oh, don't tell me, Granny, you have cheated and robbed me of my true love by a lie. Did you steal the troth ring from my neck and give it back to Evan as if from me? You have loved and honored my life long. She turned scarlet. True love? said she. You've but one true love now, Squire Turner. You have done it, I cried. It's written on your face. And she looked down at that and fell to weeping. My own true love was breaking his heart, she said. My husband and I had loved for forty years. I did it to save him. Could I let a girl's fancy, worth nothing, stand in my way and see him a beggar in his old age? Oh, girl, girl. And then I fell down at her feet like a stone. I knew nothing for an hour or more, but then, when I was better, and they left me with Jenny, I bade her fetch my hood and cloak and her own and come with me. And away I went across the moor in the starlight to where the hall windows were ablaze with light and asked the housekeeper to let me see the squire. She stared at me for my boldness, no wonder, but called him. So, 
In a moment, he stood before me in his evening dress, with his cheeks flushed and his eyes bright, and led me into a little room and seated me. Agatha, my love, I hope no mischance brings you here. But I stopped him. Not your love, Squire Turner, I said. I thank you for thinking so well of me, but after all that has passed, I... I could say no more. He took my hand. Have I offended you, Agatha? He said. Not you. The offense, the guilt. Oh, I have been sorely cheated. And all I could do was to sob. At last strength came to me. I went back to the first and told him all, how we had been plighted to each other, waiting only for better prospects to be wed, and how, when he honoured me by an offer of his hand, I angered my grandmother by owning to the truth, and of the ring Granny had stolen from my breast, and the false message that had been sent to my promised husband from me. "'And though I never see Evan Locke again,' said I, Still, I can never be another man's true love, for I am his until I die. Then, as I looked, all the rich color faded out of the squire's face, and I saw the sight we seldom see more than once in a lifetime, a strong young man in tears. At last he arose and came to me. My little Agatha never loved me, he said. Oh, me... The news is bad. I thought she did. This comes of vanity. Many a higher and fairer have hearts to give, I said. Mine was gone ere you saw me. And then, kind and gentle, as though I had not grieved him, he gave me his arm and saw me across the moor, and at the gate paused and whispered, Be at rest, Agatha. The Golden George has not sailed yet. I liked him better than I had ever done before that night when I told Granny that I would never wed him. Oh, but he was lit to be a king, the grandest, kindest, best of living men, who rode away with the break of the morrow and never stopped till he reached Liverpool and found Evan Locke just ready to set foot upon the Golden George and told him a tale that made his heart light and sent him back to me. Heaven bless him. And who was it that sent old grandfather the deed of gift that made the cottage his own? And who spoke a kind word to the gentry for young Dr. Locke that helped him into practice? Still, no one but Squire Turner, whom we taught our children to pray for every night. For we were married, and in a few years had boys and girls at our knees. And, when the eldest was nigh too, the thing I needed to make me quite happy happened and from far over the sea, where he had been three twelve months, came our squire, with the bonniest lady that ever blushed beside him, and the hall had a mistress at last, a mistress who loved the squire as I loved Evan. But it's an old story. She that I remembered a girl I saw in her coffin, withered and old, and then they opened the vault where the squire had slept ten years to put her beside him, and I have nothing left of Evan, my life and my love, but his memory, and it seems as if every hope and dream of joy I ever had were put away under tombstones, and even the Golden George, the great strong ship that would have borne my dear from me, has mouldered away at the bottom of the sea, and I think my wedding ring is like to outlast us all, for I have it yet, and I shall be ninety tomorrow. Ninety. It's a good old age, and it can't be long now before I meet heaven and the rest in heaven. Isn't this a delightful story? We've had quite a few where the poor girl is forced to wed against her will, or who she takes drastic measures to get out of an unwanted marriage, but in this story, she simply goes and tells the squire everything, and he does the right thing. Our heroine here is just delightful. She's so charming and honest and 
confident, I guess, confident enough to box the ears of the squire and to confront her family, confident enough to tell her future husband not to scold her, but she's also loving and she's forgiving and she wishes the best for everybody. It's so interesting to have a story that, like life, doesn't really have a bad guy. Even Granny, who told the lie and broke up the lovers, she points out that her husband is the love of her life, and she's trying to protect him, which is actually a remarkable perspective. Somehow in these stories, we always ascribe passionate love to the young people, but the old people who have been together forever can still also love deeply and passionately. So in a way, this is the love story of two old women. Normally, I like to do a lot of research and provide more context and information about the story at this point in the video. However, I read this story in a scan of the February 1891 edition of Short Stories magazine, which, as I have mentioned before, is practically ungoogleable. Short Stories magazine credits this story to The Gentleman's Magazine, which is definitely ungoogleable. And of course, old ladies' love story is not a very fruitful line of inquiry either. <laughs> so I guess we'll just have to take this one as it is without delving any deeper. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. Tonight's confession is that in addition to being unsearchable, an old lady's love story is not exactly clickbait. I had something else in mind for this week, another weird tale for November, but current events being what they are, I suddenly wanted to switch gears and do a story that was kind and gentle. I don't want to talk about politics, and I really don't have anything useful to say on the subject anyway, but I'm very much feeling the need for gentleness, just a bit of extra care and comfort. I am so grateful that my winter supplies, like the electric blankets and throw blankets and all these comfy things, have arrived this week. So, this video probably won't reach very many people, but if it's reached you, I am wishing you well, and I am giving you hot cocoa and fuzzy socks. If you like stories that are both obscure and comforting, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Please also drop me a comment or a like to help other people find my content. Thank you so much for the support, and I will see you in a few days.